So I want to do two things. First, I want to talk a little bit about Enigma, your business processes, where you get your information, how you use it. And then we'll talk about some of the applications. Uh, there's obviously a lot of business applications, but there's some really important humanitarian applications that you put it to work for as well. Yeah. And I want to make sure we hit those. Um, to start off, I want to, I want to quote a, um, a magazine, for a Forbes article. And the quote is, to date, Enigma has synthesized 100,000 data sets in more than 100 countries, organized intelligence on 30 million small businesses, and accumulated 140 billion points of data on the US population. So what are you doing with all that? Um, so lots of good stuff, hopefully. Um, I guess, let me kind of step back and give you a big overarching premise for us. And um, I think, um, kind of dirty secret in the data industry, which is most of the advanced AI work and all of the buzz around machine learning and what people are doing with big data is really understanding how people behave online, right? Most of it. Um, and the successes that we've heard have been these stories from um, the Googles, the Facebooks, and the Amazons of the world, and essentially using all of this very sophisticated math and this data at scale to get you to click on things on the internet, which is, you know, done some amazing stuff, like the communication paradigm that we have as human beings. But in terms of fundamentally changing how businesses work, right, be it drug safety or getting access to credit to a whole segment of the population that's been kind of left uh, by the wayside, um, by the big banks because they just don't understand them. Like putting data to work in the real world is quite difficult. So our, our goal and our mission has always been to collect um, uh, kind of a, 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 a new kind of information and, and model how the real world operates for a variety of, uh, of use cases that I'm, that I'm happy to get into. But that, that first big divide is really what we've been doing with all of it. Just trying to model how the, the actual real world works and improve it wherever we can. When you started off, a lot of people have heard of Enigma Public. Mm -hmm. You were taking public data sources, uh, government sources, and, and making that available. Yep. And then you've been adding and sort of layering more, more private data sets. Yep. Um, can you explain how that works? Totally. So, um, you know, uh, in, this, in this drive to, to kind of really understand how, uh, how things work, we just came to a point where we had understood the you know, the symbiosis in between what was available kind of openly and publicly for everyone and what we could get um, by either partnering people, partnering with people. Sometimes we get data back from our clients um, by buying data from folks who had spent, uh, uh, you know, good and hard time uh, uh, collecting it. You know, the, the fundamental process for us is, is the same, which is, does this data have signal? Uh, does it have quality? How is this data collected from a lineage point of view? I mean, just because a data set is public, does it mean that gives us you know, uh, infinite usage, right? You can't use property tax assessments in marketing situations. Uh, and sometimes those regulations are city by city, right? So for us, it wasn't that much of a, uh, that much of a shift. Um, but in the kind of scale of the, of the business operation and the questions that we're trying to answer now, we kind of have a, you know, we're agnostic as to where the source of the data comes from. The public data being, you know, the, the foundation for us to kind of resolve entities, i.e., you know, uh, uh, merge very, very disparate data sets together who sometimes don't speak to each other. Having that, that backbone reference spine of, you know, every business, every person, these sort of things um, uh, has definitely kind of gotten us to where we were in this regard. Can, can you give us an example? You, I know you have a lot of financial clients. Mm -hmm. Can you give us an example of a problem that you've solved for a financial institution, a bank or a lender? Yeah, um, we've, uh, uh, you know, we've done tons of things. Um, you know, uh, uh, I'll give you a couple. So we do a lot of compliance work. Um, you know, basically, uh, is the person or company that you're doing business with legitimate? Right? This is a question that is actually quite hard to answer. Um, and if you're a small business and you've tried to open a bank account, um, you're kind of sitting there and annoyed, like, why can't I give these people my money, right? And um, most of the time, it's because the bank's processes are just really bad in that regards. Um, but the other half of the time is there, there's some due diligence that needs to be done. And um, getting that due diligence 
like the, the kind of first 90% of that due diligence automated so that you can let folks investigate the real bad guys is something that we've done uh, quite well. We've done this for American Express and helped them with um, their anti-money laundering operations. We've done this with folks like um, uh, BB&T uh, where we you know, help score like every client that comes into the bank. So think about credit score and think about scoring someone on you know, um, basically, I call it like a shadiness factor, as it were, which should sort inform- the metric that you've calculated? Like a sh yes, the shadiness factor. Um, and it, it takes all kinds of data in and helps um, the bank basically you know, do business with, uh, with the right people much, much faster. So we're going to get to the bad guys in just a second. Um, what's, the, what's the strangest data set um, that you have, and, and what makes it useful? Um, so I think we were talking about this a little, little earlier in the back. It's like the strangest one is really I haven't found much of a good use for it. Um, but um, it would definitely be, I like some of my personal faves are understanding um, you know, the expense details for various government agencies. Like how much does the NYPD spend on bagels is something that I can mm -hmm. answer. Um, there hasn't been much use. Um, but if something unusual, and maybe given that we we're talking about politics for a while, and we use this data set in a very different way, but the voter registration data in the United States, which is a public data set, like everyone who's registered to vote, their address, all of this good stuff. Um, and it's quite hard to access and it's quite hard to structure. But it actually gives you the topography of kind of where people live, how densely, you know, how dense are they uh, uh, located to each other, how densely is the, the population. I think it's actually a, a better, if not more granular metric than the census, right? It actually gives you like a, a kind of approximate count, uh, which lets us do all kinds of interesting things. Like we help CPG companies place products like, uh, you know, uh, drinks and soups and all kinds of these things based on the profiles of where people actually live and their dri driving radiuses from businesses and all kinds of things. There's a tremendous amount of waste in that system. That supply chain is not well understood. And weirdly, voter registration data is like the chicken stock for us in that in that algorithmic recipe. Interesting. I imagine, it, but it leaves out all the people that don't vote. It leaves out uh, all the people that can't vote. Correct. Um, is that a, how much of a problem has that been? Well, it's not a problem because we don't target person by person. Okay. So our use case is always like, probabilistically, what does the like, shape of this neighborhood look like? It's a residential neighborhood. How clustered are people to the shopping centers? What's the average drive time? Like All of these things go into calculation, but it's not like, you know, your data set is incomplete, so I can't send these people a piece of marketing or I can't use it to underwrite them. That's not what we use it for. And, um, and yeah, so uh, uh, in that sense, is it does the job, uh, uh, it does the job pretty well. So you've obviously, the, you, it's sort of easy to understand the commercial applications of a lot sure. of this data. Um, but you've been, you've got a, running a number of humanitarian projects as well. Correct. Um, talk about a little bit about STAT, Stand Together Against Trafficking and the Polaris Project and what you're bringing to that, uh, that effort. Um, so this, this one is one that's kind of just born out of like what we've seen in the field, right? So we've noticed um, that, you know, much like the rest of the economy, um, and uh, folks really wanting to like found businesses and this like revived sense of entrepreneurship, that's also been ported over to the illegitimate part of the economy. So you no longer have like large mafia families controlling most of the crime, or maybe you do. Um, but there's just a massive proliferation of, um, call them like young founders in the criminal space, right? And uh, shady entrepreneurs. Shady entrepreneurs. And um, we've noticed them, um, like a pretty big uptick in human trafficking, which is like a, 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 a kind of not commonly well understood concept. Like people are trafficked all the time. It could be for farm labor, it could be for you know, uh, um, sex trafficking purposes. And um, basically, we started doing this work with the banks and helping them catch these people because they're, one, regulatorily obligated to do so. Um, and two, you know, there are massive liabilities just 
in terms of fraud and all kinds of things uh, that happen when these folks transact in your network. And then we started to see some patterns emerge that would help um, identify these folks in a more and more and more automated fashion. And we're always talking to the banks about sharing information. Um, and does anyone here work at a bank? Yeah. There's definitely some banks here. Yeah. Bank of America was just here. Uh, well, one thing that's particularly hard at a bank is sharing information. Now, I personally believe that there's good reasons for that from a privacy perspective uh, and, and all kinds of other things. Um, and, but we were trying to get the banks to initially share, like, hey, we caught X, Y, and Z. You know, be on the lookout. Uh, but that turned out to be um, actually a, a, a compliance burden in and of itself. Because if one bank told someone else, uh, and then that bank had them in their system, they basically proved yeah. that their systems for catching them weren't efficient enough. So we said, OK, you don't need to share quite share the target list or quite share the data. But what if we sent you, what if we kind of packaged everyone and got everyone to crowdsource the queries they used with the external data and the internal data. So you're not naming names, but you're saying this is how you find people. Exactly. We found people this way. You can find people the same way. Exactly. So entire industry code. So take, say, you know, this is the kind of activity for a nail salon that has resulted in uh, um, you know, multiple instances of human trafficking for us. We've noticed that nail salons or you know, uh, truck insurance companies, or and kind of help the banks um, categorize a, a, a kind of first swath of those, um, and really relying on um, Polaris and their expertise um, and their kind of uh, you know their function as an NGO of really raising awareness around this. Uh, we set up to 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 build this this crowdsourcing tool, uh, which a bunch of the banks have uh, have jumped on and. Um, you know, it's in release with a couple of folks right now. Um, it'll always be mostly um, kind of private and closed within the banks because we don't want the bad guys to catch on on, on the tools of, of the trade. Um, but um, we're, we're really excited about it. I think it's um, a good step towards sharing information in an industry that's usually extremely averse to collaborating in this kind of way. How many partners have come on? Have you, have you sensed any reluctance, or are they all like, yes, this is exactly what we've been waiting for? Um, actually, you know, the, the, the reluctance, um, when we kind of came up with this paradigm, uh, dropped pretty significantly. I think the main stage gating is the, you know, the how do we operationalize this in our processes and finding some extremely lightweight ways for them to, uh, to do so. Um, but we've had you know, tons of bank partners uh, uh, notice that some even want to fund the project now. So it's kind of like, whoa, we were just doing this you know, out of uh, just kind of seeing this expertise, trying to get you all at the, at the same table if you want to go ahead and run with us. So there's a lot of exciting stuff uh, happening in, uh, uh, in this regards. Um, I think you know, coming up with ways for people to uh, share all kinds of information is kind of what's necessary for problems like human trafficking, where the target is constantly changing. So it's no one person or no one institution that's going to have the expertise required uh, uh, to basically follow a new kind of pattern in criminal activity. Um, and listen, you know, the, a lot of people ask us, well, why isn't government doing this, right? Well, the reality of the matter is that the data actually sits in the banks, right? It sits in the banks, sits in the kind of databases that, uh, uh, that we have and that we productize. Government is a recipient of this, gets the signal it needs, and then sends boots on the ground. And um, you know, um, uh, Olivia Benson from SVU shows up to your, you know, uh, to your client and starts uh, giving you problems. But um, you know, there, there, there's a reason why there's actually a really fruitful and necessary collaboration in between uh, private and public parts of the economy here. And it's the folks that live in that world have often been in between both constantly. There's like a revolving door between compliance officers and you know, the district attorney's office. Um, and it's kind of fun to see people motivated by uh, that kind of passion as well. So this is going to be up and running. It's in beta now. It'll probably launch in a couple of months. Yeah, so it's up and running now. Um, we have like a restricted set of 
partners that we're working with mostly because you know we want to get uh, we want to get it right and we don't want to kind of onboard like the entire banking system um, at once for a pro bono project that you know um, kind of labor of love um, but this summer we'll be going uh, uh, we'll do, be doing a, a bigger round of it bigger round uh, of things in this regards and anyone's welcome to get in touch with us um, you can shoot info at enigma.com if you're interested we have someone you know a team of folks uh, dedicated and um, plenty of collaboration with folks like Polaris is why we decided to partner uh, uh, with folks who had the expertise who could kind of carry this together with us. Great. Hishim, thanks for the time. I appreciate it. Of course. It. Of course.